Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to our Savior's Lutheran Church Contemporary Praise Service featuring the vocal arrangements of our Savior's Praise Team under the direction of Ryan Hansen, Brad Browers on keyboard this morning. And a special treat, we have a special bell trio offering this morning. I'm Pastor Chris Hill, Senior Pastor here at Our Savior's, and on behalf of the rest of the ministry leadership and volunteers and indeed the entire congregation, it is my joy to welcome you here this morning, whether you are here in person or experiencing it through YouTube or Facebook. Either way, it is my honor and my joy to invite you to in experience this worship totally um, inclusively and unconditionally. You are welcome here to everything we do. So thanks for being here. God offers us this morning a chance and the abundance to bear the blessing of the cross into the world. From beginning to end, God has always loved us into those blessings. So how do we live that out? Well, we start by singing. So if you would rise together with me for our gathering song and Days of Elijah, Lord Rain on Me, and a whole bunch more.
As we gather, let us be reminded of God's promise of forgiveness as we come to the Lord in confession. We can do so confident of God's love. Because we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful, the God who is just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please pray with me. O God, our leader and guide, in the waters of baptism you bring us to new birth to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises that by your Spirit we may lift up your life to all the world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
First reading is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. God's call of Abram and Sarah has a clear purpose, that through them all the families of the earth would gain a blessing. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 17. In the person and example of Abraham, we discover that a right relationship with God is not earned, but a promise of faith. What shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. A person who works is paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. But those who depend on faith, not on deeds, and who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. When God promised Abraham and his descendants that the world would belong to him, he did so not because Abraham obeyed the law, but because he believed and was accepted as righteous by God. For if what God promises is to be given to those who obey the law, then faith means nothing, and God's promise is worthless. The law brings down God's anger, but where there is no law, there is no disobeying of the law. And so the promise was based on faith, in order that the promise should be guaranteed as God's free gift to all of Abraham's descendants not just to those who obey the law, but also to those who believe, as Abraham did. For Abraham is the spiritual father of us all. As the scripture says, I have made your father of many nations. So the promise is good in the sight of God, in whom Abraham believed, the God who brings the dead to life, and whose command brings into being what does not exist. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. As we prepare for Jesus' story this morning, I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds by rising together and preparing your hearts in silence. For the second Sunday in Lent, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, Verses 1 through 17. Hear this story. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Could I get the children up for today's children's message? Welcome, welcome, welcome. There's one back there. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. A couple others are thinking about coming. There's, a, there's like two or three really important things that I want to share with you. First of all, I need you to know that it's really, really true that Jesus came to this world for you. Every one of you. And you need to know that Jesus came for all of those people too. And Jesus came for all you people in your family. And Jesus came for everybody that you see in school. And Jesus came for your grandparents and your aunts and uncles and your cousins and friends and everybody who loves you. And maybe some people who don't even love you. Jesus came and loves everybody. One of the verses I just read said that, that God sent his only son because he loved us so much. So that's one thing. God loves us so much. I hope you remember that. So the second thing I want you to remember is that God loves us so much that he wants to help us so that we can help other people. Now, you might go, well, wait a minute. I'm just a little person. How am I supposed to help anybody? Well, we're going to practice that. So can, uh, can, can, I, can I borrow you for a minute? Yeah. Do you need something to prayed for? Do you need to be prayed for this morning? Yeah. yeah. All right. Come on. <laughs> you got your hands full. So if you could stand up, let's, let's stand around him, okay? Yeah, come on up. We're going to stand around him, and we're going we're gonna, to, we're, let's make a big circle around him, and we're going to pray for him, okay? And what we're going to do, and we're, so we're not going to make you, you know, tell us what you need praying for, um, but. I'll give you one guess right now. Okay, something about kids, maybe. I don't know. Okay, so here's, let's repeat after me, okay? Thank you, God, for your love, and help this man and his family and his kids all the time. Thank you. Amen. It's really that easy. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus for us so that we could pray for each other and help each other. And we just did that. So anywhere you go, and you don't have to surround them like we surrounded him. You can pray for people just when you see them. You can pray for them anytime. You think you can do that? All right, thanks for coming up. Thanks for practicing. Thanks for being a willing victim. <laughs> She's going to go the other way. Yes, he does need our prayers. <laughs> but then so do you. That's the thing with God's love. God's love makes it possible for us to be those praying people. God makes it possible for us to make John 3.16 come alive. Now, I bet a lot of you know and could probably even quote from memory John 3.16. When I was a kid, John 3.16, it was written, the whole verse wasn't written out, but there was some guy with a, with a rainbow afro wig that would sit in the end zone at, at just about every football game and hold up a sign that said John 3.16. Now, I learned John 3.16 probably from the King James Version. And so, you know, if you, if you if, if, repeat it in your heads if you know this, because maybe you've learned it from a, a different version, but this is how I learned it. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, whosoever believeth in him may not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Now the next verse, John 3.17 we read this morning, and it's not quite as famous, but together 16 and 17 shape what is often called the, the gospel summary of the gospel. The two verses that uh, summarize all of, all of the good news in two verses. Indeed, verse 17 reads, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Maybe I'm just being cranky, but it seems like a lot of people who are called Christians or a bunch of church folk that claim to be born again have been using that John 3.16, that first verse, that famous verse, as kind of a club on people, sort of to exclude other people from God's love. That's why, that's why it's important that you don't have just John 3.16 in your brain, but John 3.17, because it finishes the story. The message version reads at verse 17 like this, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it is. He came to help, to put the world right again. 16 and 17 have to be heard and lived and understood together. This is exactly the same kind of blessing that God invited Abram in our first lesson today to bring with him on his journey of faith, his journey to the promised land, his journey into the promise. And that promise, that story of the promised land, it's, it's, it is about a real place, but it's also a, about the, the promise of God's presence to go with Abram and Sarai and Lot and all of their folk and all of their stuff as God called them out and sent them out and they went. This is the blessing God invited Abram to bring with him on his journey to the promise. Later on, Abram gets renamed by God to be Abraham, and Sarai gets renamed Sarah as they live into that promise and as they live into that blessing. It changes who they are. It changes how they act. But it starts with Abram and Sarai just going where God sent them. But not, not empty-handed. And not just with the things of this world that they picked up and took with them. As the second lesson reminded us, we, we, we serve a God. We are blessed by a God. We are forgiven by a God who speaks and makes the world happen. So as, as God calls Abram and Sarai to go, he promises them with his word. He speaks and, and, it, and it becomes real. God said, and if you remember the beginning of, of Genesis, God speaks and the, and the universe is created. It's that same power. It's that same blessing. It's that same creative force that, that God pours into Abram and Sarai's lives when he says, I will show you a great land. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless you. I will bless you. Like three different times, God promises Abram and Sarai that he will bless them. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is God speaking life, creating a promise, creating a new world, creating the life from above in Abram and Sarai. And God is calling us to that same journey, to that same promised land, to that same blessed and blessing pilgrimage. God speaks in our baptism into us, reminded by Jesus that we do get to be born from above. We do get to be born of water and the Spirit. And in that, then, God calls us to that same journey, to that same blessed and blessing pilgrimage. Lent helps us to remember that every year. Part of our journey to and through the cross is to remind us why Jesus came. To tell us again about that abundance and about that blessing. To tell us again about how God has breathed and washed 
and empowered us with new life. Lent reminds us why Jesus came and why he let the cross claim him. The Good News version of John 3, 17, for God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Paul in Romans explains and reminds our faith is to be called into existence for this very inclusive, love-driven, love-made-real reason. Verse 5 of our lesson this morning, but those who depend on faith, not deeds, and to believe in God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. So in water and the Spirit, we are reborn. And in that faith, then we can act like Jesus. Then we can act like Abram and Sarai. In that faith, we can go where God sends us. In that faith, we can love and live and change the world. In that faith, we can repeat the truth. God so loved the world that he, didn't give his, that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We can repeat that and mean it and be powered by it. In that faith, we can love and live and change the world. In that faith, we can repeat the truth and invite each other to abide in it and to encourage each other to work with us. We can be reborn into the faith that surrounds busy fathers and busy mothers with support and understanding and a chuckle and a smile when the kids get a little bit out of hand. Because God loves them. And we teach our children to sing, Jesus loves the little children. And then so do we. We can be reborn into that faith that indeed God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In that faith, we can be reborn into a vision for how to be a blessing to the world around us. And maybe even specifically to the world around us. To our neighbors, our neighborhood. In faith, maybe we can look to the south of this building, just across a very small street, and behold a mission field. Behold a whole bunch of people, children and parents and staff, that are there making a difference for our kids that maybe we can support, or maybe we can help, or maybe we can minister with, or maybe we can minister to it's been one of the drums I've been beating here in the seven years I've been here. It's like there's this building here and there's this building there, and it's almost like there's this fog or wall or, or dead zone between us that we just kind of ignore those folks over there, a town's worth, a city's worth of children and their families. Maybe this faith, maybe this Abram and Sarai-like call could awaken in us some kind of vision to respond even more than we have already to the needs to the south in that school. Maybe we could partner with our brothers and sisters a couple of blocks further to the south to dream and work together with Zion and so the, this school and us and all this church and this community together can, can be made more alive. Maybe. Maybe in that same faith we can look to the north and to the east and, and to the west into the blocks around us in our own neighborhood and catch a vision for mission and ministry that they need us to embrace. It's, <laughs> I'm a little ashamed, really. Um, seven years, have my office right over there. With, on a good day, I could probably spit and hit a number of the neighbors' houses, but I only know who lives there, the old parsonage. 
Our children, youth, and family director and her family, the Hamiltons, live there. You head to the west and a couple, three houses down, I know who lives there. Linda Eastgate, a member, lifelong member here. Other than that, I don't know our neighbors. I don't. I'm embarrassed. I don't know who lives in that house over there. I don't know who lives in the house with all the dogs and the, and the penned-in yard over there. I kind of know the dogs, but I don't know the people. I don't know who lives next to them. I, don't, um, I just found out that Dwayne's mother lives somewhere in the neighborhood. But I don't know. I didn't know that. Maybe this same faith that called Abram and Sarai and that, that Jesus says gives us new birth can, can birth a new kind of vision for, for reaching into the very lives of the people that are right here in the neighborhood with us. It can move us in new ways, new visions, and new mission. Or maybe even old stuff that we've done before that we can do with those people, whoever they are. In faith, maybe we can be Sunday nursery volunteers or welcome team people or stewardship team advocates or the next vice president of the congregation or, or the next part of the next trio of Palanca deacons. If you feel like God is pulling you toward any of that or to even, maybe even to something else that... I, you know, something new, something different, or something old that we should be, be going back to, or some, something, some new vision of, of mission and ministry around us, talk to me. Talk to Pastor Karen. Talk to Jennifer. Call the church. There's that little card kind of thing in your bulletin that says ministry contact request thing. Use that sucker. Talk to us. Communicate with us. We have email. That's a miracle of God. There's an old miracle, and it's called the f f phone. We have one guy at first service who almost every week uses that little square to talk to us about people that he knows need us to pray for them. And I can tell you that he and the people he has us pray for are blessed. And so are we when you do it. Use it. Use it to volunteer. Use it to share ideas. I mean, I, you know, I'm pretty approachable. I, but Pastor Karen's pretty scary. <laughs> oh, she's not here. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. But there's tons of ways that we can talk. That we can hear God's call upon us like Abram and Sarai did and, 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 and Jesus' own voice calling us to new birth. Tons of ways. Speak, we will listen. If God is pulling you in any of those directions or some other. The future of this congregation, the future of Christ in this community depends on us being ready to hear God's new call, a vision for mission and ministry, a, a, a journey into a new promised land. I want to close today with a poem, this Pastor Steve Garnis Holmes' Unfolding Light poem for these lessons this week. Because I was both warmed and challenged warmed up in my soul and challenged in my brain and in my soul at the same time by the words of this poem. I want to close with it today. First, he calls out to us, Dearly beloved, grace and peace to you. And then he quotes John 3.8, The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then he reminds us of God's call to Abram in Genesis 12. God said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is his poem. Wind of God, blow me where you will. Fill my sails. Be my course. 
Raise my anchor holding so fast. Cut the lines that tie me to the dock. Your deep breathing and laboring love birth me through this canal of life into life. Lead me to a place I can't name, can't control, can't choose first. Even if the strange place is within, the foreign land, my neighbor, spirit, my wind on the baptismal water, give me courage to be blown off course with love, abandon my ego's maps, breathe me into the new world. You, my ship, my captain, my natal sea, my breath, the only place I hope to go. Deep blessings. Deep blessings. Pastor Steve. Our song reminds us where the abundance that makes this happen comes from. Love divine.
As you are able, I invite you to rise together to claim that faith, that new birth, that rebirth by water and the Spirit. We'll affirm that faith once again using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Many of you have noticed and taken steps because of the considerable concern that there is in the world around us about the potential impact of a variety of viruses, some old, some new, some we know of, and some we just haven't just barely started to figure out. To err on the side of protection and health safety, I was just in Washington. Everybody that's dying of the coronavirus is, in, is just about is in Washington, so it's for your own protection. Anyway, for the next few weeks during this season of Lent, in any case, we're going to sort of simplify this sharing of the peace. Um, if you find wonderful ways to greet one another now and, and after the worship, that's that's, that's a beautiful thing. But for our, our liturgy, for our service for the next few weeks, um, we'll let the greeting that we exchange back and forth here be all-encompassing. When I greet you with the peace and you return that to me, um, feel that as a, as a sharing of the peace throughout, throughout the space and, throughout, and for one another. So, and then now during the season of Lent, we'll move directly from that, to our, our, to, from that greeting to our offering. So, the peace of Christ be with you always. Please be seated as we gather this morning's offering. And as this offering is gathered, thank you for your support, the financial support that you share with, and prayerful support and volunteer support. Um, this early season this, of, of the year has has, uh, has been a good, a good start. But 2020 is a marker point year for us. The Mission Appeal is wrapping up um, at the, in, a, in September. Um, that three-year appeal that we've been using for a variety of, of ministry um, and for a variety of, of rebuilding and, and repairs around the congregation and around the church, the three-year portion of that in September will be coming to a close. But the mission that we're hoping to, to continue will not stop in September. The Mission Appeal is wrapping up Rejoice, Renew, Reach, but the ministry that it was designed to begin to support needs to continue. So in order to keep Pastor Karen and her visitation and the other ministry that she does and others of our ministries as well, in order to keep those growing, your financial support will need to continue, at least at the extra Mission Appeal levels that many of you have so generously provided. Um, perhaps even beyond a number of you um, gave to Rejoice Renew Reach the Mission Appeal, a one-time gift at the beginning of things almost three years ago. Um, if you could think about um, a similar kind of gift going forward, either a one-time gift or um, breaking that out to, um, to a, a monthly kind of gift, um, the, the ongoing ministry of our, of our congregation will need to, be, to step up to um, really those Mission Appeal levels. Um, and to maintain that going forward. So thank you for your prayerful consideration of your ongoing support of the work and ministry of our church together. That ongoing ministry includes prayers for uh, those in grief and our funeral ministry. The flowers on the altar this morning are a reminder to us of a, of a couple of losses in our community. We had um, Dale Pearson's funeral here this past Thursday. The red flowers are in memory and in honor of him. The other bouquet is in memory and in honor of Penny Waite. Um, Sonia, um, Sonia Wick's daughter, if you would continue to keep those families in your prayers and uh, let these flowers be a reminder to that. This Wednesday evening, um, our 
Lenten ministry will feature turkey vegetable, turkey vegetable soup, and potato soup. And then in the service, in the midst of the Holden evening prayer, that worship, the presentation will be about forgiveness after crime, featuring Dale Knutson and Don Struford. Um, then with some other announcements this morning about ch our children, youth, and family ministry, here's our director, Jennifer Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning. Just a few announcements for you this morning. So Lent Soup Suppers, like Pastor Chris mentioned, um, I forgot to put one of the sign-up sheets, sign sheets out there um, for milk. So if you don't mind signing up for milk, to donate milk on Wednesday, that would be amazing. Um, also for sign-up sheets, I have for Easter breakfast, um, either to donate items or donate your time. I need lots of help um, to make that happen. So I would appreciate any time um, you have or donating items would be wonderful. Also, just so you know, our busy bags are going to be redone in time for Easter, and so I will have a giving tree out next week um, for items to go in the busy bags or um, a few items for the nursery to kind of finish that up too. So do be aware that those are coming um, because we have some more young families, and that's a wonderful thing. So um, Finally, spaghetti um, fundraiser. We do a spaghetti fundraiser for the preschool every year. We have a preschool here. Um, and those tickets will be on sale after service today. Otherwise, you can always um, get them at the door as well. The fundraiser is next Sunday, March 15th, um, from 10 to 2. So I encourage everybody to participate in that. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Would you rise together as we present our gifts and move into our time of intercessory prayer? Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy and generous host, you set a table where we feast as friends. Prepare us to witness to your goodness with every gift you have given us to share that all people may know your peace through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of rebirth, empower your church throughout the world to be a voice for hope for all those who fear judgment or condemnation. Help us remember the true nature of your love, a love shown for all people. Assure us of your faithfulness and give us confidence to proclaim that salvation to all people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of rebirth, guide us to healthy practices in our daily lives that protect our own lives and the lives of those around us. Help government leaders around the world to consider the full consequences of any plans that they may come up with to combat illnesses and viruses, both new and old. Help us experience your healing. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of rebirth, lead the nations in your way of righteousness. Protect those who advocate for the needs of children, migrants, and victims of violence. Give courage to lawmakers, lawyers, judges, and law enforcement officers, guiding all of us together to justice and to love mercy. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of rebirth, give us a new vision of your healing power among us. Restore hope to those who remain in the depths of depression or despair. Bring mercy and relief to those who are injured or sick or suffering, including those that we know need your healing touch for grief, like Sonia Wick and the rest of her family, and Joanne Pearson and the rest of her families, and then others whom we know need your healing for anything in their lives, your strength for anything in their lives, as we name them in our hearts before you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of rebirth, we thank you for the children of this community and the people and ministries that care for them. 
including Washington School and Churchill School and our high schools and middle schools, and including Katherine Anderson, who leads the Children, Youth, and Family Ministry for our Synod, and our own Jennifer Hamilton, as she leads the Children, Youth, and Family Ministry of this congregation. Bless our Chris Ed team and Roxanne and Julie and all of our teachers and supporters and parents and students, as together we work to share leadership and to teaching and the story of your new life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Whatever else you, O oh Lord, see that we need, whatever lies hidden in our hearts, whatever we fear or have forgotten to share with you, whatever joys we need to turn over to your credit, help us to give that all over to you in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, O Lord, as we prepare to hear and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who gave us this holy supper, Hear us, O Lord. In response to the call of God, the command of Jesus Christ, and the bond of our common faith, we come to the table. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. In response to the love of our Creator, and remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus, our Savior, we come to the table. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. In the grapes comes a similar reminder of the same stories, the same love, they are a gift that reminds the youngest among us of that same grace, of the same story alive in Jesus' gift to us. Following our Lord's command and responding to our need for forgiveness, we come. Please be seated. In a moment, the ushers will be inviting you forward. We'll be serving, as usual, at two stations. You are all, each and every one of you, welcome at this table. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to be Lutheran. It's about Jesus, and he has invited you. He has offered you this taste of the new life. So you are welcome here. If you need gluten-free wafers, they will be available at either station. There's grape juice in the inner ring of each of the wine trays if you need that. Um, if you want to remember your baptism at the font as you come forward, you're welcome to do that if you'd like to stop and pray at the altar rail before you return to your place. You're welcome to do that as well. The basic point is, you're all welcome here.
Would you rise together with me? May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ remind us of our new birth from water and the Spirit. May we be strengthened together to share that love. Now pray with me if you would. We thank you, living God, for the body and blood of your Son, which sustains us in the wilderness and the garden alike. As Christ has loved us in this feast, so send us to love Christ in our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.